Martin with the Coquille Alex Heart Group, and today we're going to be talking about Gaydon Nokomai. Gaydon is literally lower level, and it is the, the low attitude of fencing in uh, Kyoho's strategy. Now, Gaydon is, uh, it is a particularly useful Kamai, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of Kyoho in general. Um, of our 12 longsword kata, half of them begin with Shidachi working from Gero no um, It has a lot, of, a lot of utility for a position that seems at first maybe a little underwhelming. Um, we've talked about before how in Yoho we have this sort of uh, internal concept that a low beats high. Right, and to sort of build on that a bit, uh, with Gaidon, uh, it is particularly useful when either your opponents have uh, maybe not so much skill, or when they're trying to um, overcome you by the, the virtue of their, their physical strength alone. Um, Gidon is really good at kind of suckering these guys in and, and working them over. It is also, uh, you know, a position that is pretty strong when you're working against more than one opponent. Um, it, it takes a little bit of getting used to, though. Um, most of us, uh, when we're faced with, with danger and hardship, right? We really want to get that sword out there between us and them. Use our use our point kind of like a shield to drive the enemy back and keep their distance. Um, in Yoho, this is this is almost exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. We want uh, when there are more than more than one person working against us, we want to very rapidly into their space or cause them to enter our space. And Gaidon has uh, several things going for it that really assist in, in both of those ventures. So, um, we'll go ahead and take a look at how to get into position. Adopting the lower attitude of Gaidon Nakamai. So, we start off from Chudon, I'll do it once from the front, and then from the side. So, right foot slightly forward to the left foot, tail is tucked, shoulders relaxed, head lifts up, tip is in throat level. What we want to do as we begin to move into the lower attitude is to press forward with our tip, as though we are pushing the sword into their throat and down through their sternum, down through their belly, and we pause uh, right at the heart. Right, the hara is basically right in the belt level, level, sort of just below your uh, elbow. Right. From here, the rear hand disengages, the hands come to either side of your hip and relax. The sword tip, the kisaki, is in line with the front of your knee. Your hands match the shape between your thumb and wrist with the nook in your hip. Your hands should match in shape. Uh, some instructors will have you uh, palm your hip, um, but I think that this is kind of contrary to the overall strategy of this Kamai, so we don't do that. Thank you. Nice and easy, nice and relaxed. From the side, Again, we push forward, down, through. We're slowly in this rhythm, right? We stop at the heart, right? And our hands break. Spread to the side and relax. Tip level with the knees, hands on the hips, tail is tucked, head lifts. Okay? Pretty simple, pretty easy. Some points uh, of interest here, right? You want to make sure that as you come down, right, it's nice and even, and your elbows are in a relaxed rear. 
rearward position. What we're trying to do here is completely conceal the form of your body and the, the form and length of your sword. Uh, again, when it sits in front of your knee, it's going to be at that 45 degree position that breaks down their measuring ability. Um, as a general rule, you'll angle your mune uh, as if to their eyes. So it's not straight up and down, it's also not sideways, but just ever so slightly angled. Right? Um, we don't want to tip out, we don't want to tip in, we want it right in front of the knee so that uh, while my bokeh stands out quite vividly against the black of my pants, uh, a sword won't necessarily so much. Depends on the direction of the light source. But in a lot of cases, uh, especially when the light's behind you, the reflective quality of the sword picks up the colors of the area around it, and it, it really makes it difficult to, to see clearly. Uh, you know it's there, but your, your subconscious has a hard time processing any useful information about that. Um, same thing is true with the space between our arms and body, right? If my, my elbows are out like this and I walk, you have a much easier time beginning to measure uh, this whole space. Any movement I make to the side uh, also becomes really, really apparent. Whereas when I start to shift with that contrast closed off, it, it makes it harder to see. Um, now, this is... In the beginning, this can seem like real, real kind of small stuff, especially when you're training, um, you know, at kind of beginner level speeds where the other person, regardless of their body position, seems to be very obviously there. You don't really have a lot of trouble, you know, figuring out that they're moving forward to you, especially in kata, which is all pre-planned out anyway, so you kind of know the movie before you watch it. Uh, where you really start to see uh, the virtue of this, these, these subtle uh, alterations in body composition is, um, outside of power, when you start really speeding things up, then, you know, you, you're really relying on those, those back-of-the-mind processes, and all this work that we do to break it down really comes into play. Uh, you'll find yourself, especially when you first start off, getting hit by the senior students uh, real quick, real often. Uh, not because necessarily they're going faster than you, but because your ability to judge not only how far they are from you, but where they are in relative space to you is retarded by your body position. Um, so, you know, have a little faith, go with it, and then watch it in your, your kumitachi, your uh, sparring work, your free play work, right? Or even your, your more free form drills. Now, yeah, those are those are the main things. Cut through, right? Don't just drop it, right? Cut, press, relax, release, settle. Easy as possible. Some areas where people have trouble with get on uh, are typically in how their, their body is shaped in the position, right? Oftentimes, what they'll do is they just drop their sword kind of straight down in this kind of releasing motion. Um, and it's not that this is bad necessarily, um, but more that it is just it doesn't apply the rest of our strategy, the, the way we work with sending pressure uh, into the work 
And so even though it's it's not a huge detriment to do it that way, it's not really, uh, it doesn't fit cohesively with the rest of the work. So we try and keep everything working in that same kind of uh, kind of schema or paradigm, right? Also, a lot of times, uh, what people will do, even if they press down and through, right, whoop, they'll come out like this, right? Especially in the beginning, and they'll have this huge space in the side, really gives a lot of contrast, really lets people see what they're doing easily. Uh, another problem is sort of architecturally. You see, to, to have this arm wung out to the side like this, my wrist has to be in this uh, fairly off position and I end up supporting the weight of the sword with my hand alone. Whereas in, in the shootout itself, especially when you're in good position, right, the sword is resting against your forearm and you're literally holding it with almost no force at all. This makes this a particularly useful position. This and the lucky the my positions. Uh, for when you end up using a sword that has a lot of heft to it, right? Um, we tend to think about high positions as being easier for heavier swords, um, but you don't know if your sword is a little uh, you know, chunky, right? We'll usually use one of the low positions, uh, walking up high or um, now, in contrast, generally when people find out that, hey, you know, this big see-through triangle is an error, what they will do to fix it is they'll try and pull their elbows way back. So, even if my back is straight to begin with, as I start to pull and wrench those elbows, it pulls and wrenches my shoulders back, um, which drives the top half of my body further off the line of support. It, begins to transfer my weight closer to my heels. Um, if I'm not attentive to it, I'll be all the way on my heels, and that's, both of them are bad, right? So, what you want to do is relax your elbows down rather than back. Down, not back, right? So again, and elbows are relaxed. Down, I've eliminated the space. Um, not clenching, right? I'm not like, and then like sucking in real hard. I want a soft, fairly natural, fairly uh, comfortable position to work from. Does that make sense? Pretty simple. Pretty easy. Um, that's about it for common mistakes. The strategy of Geda Makamai. Um, Masashi advises us that uh, when, when our spirit lessens, we can lower into Geda. Um, and a lot of people, uh, well, I don't know about a lot of people, but it seems to me that this could be easily construed to mean that when you want to fight less, or when you're feeling more reticent, or or any kind of like uh, feeling sorry for yourself, lowering, um, and that's not what this is. Uh, the lowering spirit in this means that I'm I'm more calm. I don't have the I don't have that kind of fiery young drive. Uh, to destroy my enemy right now and to just take full control of a very type A personality kind of just and, and get the work done. Uh, for me personally, my the outside of my the Mode, right, tends to be very uh, kinetic, right? It's very active. Um, on the outside, I'm, I'm really pushing and harassing and driving and positioning and, uh, and, and working. Right. But on the inside, uh, I tend to be real level, real calm, really even. So for me, this gate on position is excellent, right? I can still drive the guy around as I start to, to work or whatever. Um, but 
uh, still have a posture that is is matching that that internal level of calmness. Uh, now, when I get more excited and I'm like, oh yeah, I really start to get into the work, right? Then I'll I'll rise up into the high guards or or moji and then into the high guards. But uh, typically, I do a lot of work from the get on position. Though, that may also just be because it is so prominent in the longsword katas. Um, you know, so take the grain of salt experiment with it and try and try and find your ease. Now, in the beginning, we talked about how the gain on position is useful for when you're fighting more than one opponent, right? And the reason for that is, one, I'm not running off, right? When, when you take that shoot on position, and you're, you're spearing the guy, right? Uh, or when you're in, in hustle, in general, right? you're in the high guard position, and you, you're in there, you are in a position where he knows that you are getting ready to whack him, or that he knows that he has to work past this uh, sort of spear of your sword, people tend to take back a little bit, right? And they, they start figuring out how they can work in without getting hit. Uh, in contrast, Gaidon is a very uh, non-aggressive looking posture. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even necessarily look defensive, right? The sword's out of the way. The primary focus area of the body uh, or that they see with their eyes when they're looking at your face seems to be completely devoid of any protection, and you just, you appear to be very vulnerable, right? Or at least uninvolved in the fight, right? Because even if I take up uh, maybe a, a more classic Gaga, where it's it's rotated out of the way, almost like when you mine, or down here, or, or sort of a, a straighter Gaga, it's still obvious that, that I am fighting, that I am in fighting. Whereas when you're in this low position, it just it doesn't have that same uh, feeling for folks. Now this is this is good for two reasons. One, it, uh, it it encourages them to just come in and work, right? Sort of fearlessly drive in. I mean, yeah, if they're sort of intermediate type or skill level, they'll, and they've, they've gauged your level, like you've done something to kind of reveal your, your relative proficiency to the person. Uh, they're going to know that you're up to something and they're going to try and sort of suss you out, right? They're going to try and get you to reveal to them. They're either going to pull back the curtain, make you show the type of work that you intend to do so that they can then build a strategy off of it. Um, as an aside, if in the off chance you get caught in something like that, switch your strategy right away. Completely abandon what you were doing, do something different. Um, you know, it, you can usually do something once, right? And sometimes you can get away with it a second time, but a third time you're, people wise up, they don't want to be hit. Um, and if you're not finishing the work, you're giving them time to adapt and evolve. Anyway, so the other way in which this method is a benefit of uh, to you in terms of getting close to the other person is that a lot of times, if my sword is up, ready to cut the person, I will cut them the moment they are in the furthest range, right? So if I'm trying to, to cut at the board, right, right, I'll, I'll, I'll and then cut it the moment I think that, that the tippiest tip of my own G is, is in range to swap, right? Now this isn't real great. Um, you know, we have this idea of the uh, Chinese monkey, right? And the Chinese monkey is a monkey whose, whose arms are, are short, right? And that is that if we want to fence the dude, right, we are not trying to reach him 
by the virtue of the length of our arms, right? Uh, we don't reach with our arms, we reach with our legs, right? We drive in close to the body and then cut in a method that is good and strong. This helps to sort of alleviate the, the possibility that they can just use their tights and money to get out of the way. Um, and it, it, you'll see this more in the context, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, I don't know. But the point is, when you're in the high guard, it is instinctual to sort of reach and cut. Uh, when you're in the middle guard, it, you, you, you're keeping them away, they're keeping you away. And so it makes it hard, like you can't just drop the middle guard or the low guard and, and hop on in because you've already set up that kind of the parameters of the relationship of the fight that you're in. But, if you start off in Vietnam, now, there's, there's nothing that wards him from entering my space, or me from entering his, right? So, and this is, this is true even if he's in Khmer, like, uh, shoot up, though typically you'll use this against uh, people who are in high guards. Because again, low beats high. And Chudan, even though it's a defensive position, um, they, there are whole schools where Chudan is their focus and they will, they'll work you over just as well if you're not, you know, sort of respectful of their, their position and space that they control. So, by being in the low guard, I don't set myself in a, a disadvantage by wanting to attack him too soon or too far, right? I also don't drive him away, sort of psychologically. That doesn't mean that I can't attack easily. Um, the, the fourth and fifth combats of Kinagashi are our introduction to the beginning ways that we can attack with this. Um, well, I guess Sasen would be the, the real introduction, you know, and come in and poke him. Uh, but in terms of cuts, the Kinagashi comes in next. So, uh, being able to, to strike in these sort of uh, kiriage type motions, right, uh, is, is, is really not appreciably harder than striking down uh, from Lasso. So, that is pretty much it for the strategy of Gaidon, as we can easily explain it now. Again, in the comment, you'll see more. So, we'll go from there. Gaidon no Kamai with two swords. So, Gaidon no Kamai with two swords is pretty simple, pretty easy. Again, we start from that shoot on position and we drop down in that same cutting, motion, pressing, cutting, driving, slipping back. Now the difference is, uh, well it's not really a difference, but the way we do it with the short, ball, the, the short sword, the tip is still going to be in front of your knee. Now, what this means is, as you can see from the side, our swords are dramatically different angles. But, when viewed from the front, they seem to be almost the same length. Right. Again, we're angling the mune slightly towards the eyes of our assailant. To get this rear position, you really have to just point it down. And it's quite uncomfortable in the beginning, especially if you're the type of person that's inclined uh, to really over grip, right? Because that tight grip and then strong wrist extension is uh, both weak and uncomfortable. Uh, so, uh, the trick, if there is one, uh, my ska is a little bit longer, um, so I can still do the rest, right? But even if you're working with a short ska, uh, short, let's say, Maybe you're using a tonto, maybe you just have a really short scot. Right? You can do the same thing, just resting it against the triangle bone in your palm. And again, hold it with next to 
through no muscular effort. You're just sort of mechanically balancing it. is get up with two swords. Get up with the shoto, uh, the short sword, is the same as with the short sword position in the two swords, except that you're using your dominant hand, your right hand, right? Because there are no left-handed people in Japan. <laughs> uh, again, from that shoto position, I carve down release back, and I rest it so that the kisaki is level with my knee, or as level as I can manage to make it. Okay. Pretty simple. Pretty easy. I figured we'd take this opportunity to talk about Kamai and how it relates to, to other schools of fencing, not just Japanese schools, but European. So, uh, at this point, we've talked about Haso and Jodan, Chudan, and Gato, upper, middle, and lower level attitudes. Now, these, these attitudes are not unique to the Japanese. Even the concept of attitude itself is not unique to the Japanese but is found in the fencing traditions and the fighting traditions of pretty much everyone else on the earth. Um, so I thought I would give you some good examples of some German work that uh, shows this. You can start to see the similarities between our sort of fighting methods and theirs. Uh, this is not to say that the methods are identical, but rather that we're all using very similar tool technology to accomplish the same task, uh, which is taking apart another person efficiently without having them do the same to us. So, in the German tradition, they also have guards. Primarily four guards. Uh, the first, which is von Pog. Oh my gosh, that looks real familiar, isn't it? Now, von Pog means at the roof. And it is everything where your sword is high and above your head, right? The Germans are a lot more open with their concept of guard, uh, which I think is to their benefit. You know, they say, oh, well, everything in this range is Wundtag, and then they'll have work that says, oh, if the person is in Wundtag, this is how you can break that position with this specific kind of work. So it's a little bit, it's, it's a lot more beginner-friendly, uh, a lot more efficient as a method of fielding troops uh, with this knowledge in a small amount of time. So, from Vonta, we can, let's say, drop down to Albert. Ooh, just like you know, right? And again, Albert can be anything where the sword is below the hip line. In any kind of orientation, it does not matter so much. Now, the Italians and sort of the later German work begin to, to add in positions that are sort of specifically arranged to accomplish specific uh, tasks or to work with specific strategies, but in, in the early German work, that's not so much a thing. From there, we can rise into the middle guard of plow, right? Now, uh, Albert means the fool, the plow is literally the plow, like the plow blade driving into your opponent, uh, which is basically exactly how they use it. Uh, in the German fighting method, uh, you, you don't block, right? You just cut them better. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it is very aggressive, very much seizing the initiative and driving through your opponent. Um, it's another thing that makes it good for teaching sort of large groups of people in a short amount of time. Uh, from plow, the sort of fourth position is ox, right? This is a 
more dexterous fencing position and what would later evolve into the, the rapier fighting of the Renaissance. Um, but the point is, just like the Germans, you can think of Kamai as a region, right? And you use that understanding of the sword's behavior within those regions to kind of shape your strategy and, and how you go about breaking them down. Because inevitably, uh, especially when you're beginning, you're working with other beginning students. And so the tendency is for them to, you know, maybe adopt Judon and, you know, this is what they're, they're driving with. Or to adopt hustle and they, okay, well I know that I'm going to come here and whack it or come here and whack it or, 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 or strike in whatever kind of fashion that my style teaches. And it can seem uh, overly mechanical, overly contrived. Right, because the people are still uncomfortable with the work. It's it hasn't yet integrated into into them. Right. So thinking about the sword positions as both where the sword is in relative space to their body, but also in the kind of mental and psychological attitudes that sort of go hand in hand with it can really help you to. Uh, break the work apart, right? To break them down. And this is again something that is not limited, just defensing, right? Say so you're in a self defense situation, a guy posts up high, what's he in? Right? Well, that's, that's pretty uh, Jodon esque, right? One high, one forward, you know? Same way you'll get some I'm sort of uh, traditional Jiu Jitsu guys, and they'll start off. Low, or they'll be in here, right? It's like, oh, well, that's you know, that's below belt line. This is all they're working in gate on, right? Uh, same thing with some of those sort of modern self defense arts with their their keyboard position. Why is it this? Because it's defensive, right? It, it allows that protection. You're holding that center line. You're you're in tune. It's the same thing. Uh, nothing, nothing special, right? Now. On your own, you can take that and think about how it applies beyond fighting, right? Do, do people have attitudes when they speak to you? Right? Think about it, right? And, and even beyond individual interactions, do countries have attitudes, right? Postures they adopt, right? When you start to see how these, these things work and interconnect with everything, Really, that's that's when your real work can begin. So that's that for now. And that's it for Dino. Uh, it's a great position. It's a strong position. Uh, again, useful if you're dealing with people that are trying to just over muscle you, or if you're dealing with people with low skill, or if you're dealing with you know several dudes at once. It's just it's a really really pleasant position to work from with a lot of utility. And uh, for me, it was the position that I could really start to study uh, the, the concepts of driving distance between me and Teki, me and my opponent. Um, understand that distance and then understand how to sort of break apart a person's perception of that distance. You know, it's, it's what I use to start really studying my stepping and how, when I'm working in sort of free play with someone, how I can step to dramatically foreshorten that distance without really kind of letting them in on the trick. Um, so it's it's a it's a very useful position to to know and to spend kind of extra time studying, in my opinion. Uh, whereas positions like hustle. Uh, are a lot more simplistic. They have a benefit and a strength in that simplicity, right? Just like a, a scalpel is very specialized but very strong for that task. Gaidon is less of a scalpel and, and more of a multi-tool. So. But, as always, the best way to really start to understand this is to just go pick up a sword 
and go train. <laughs>